topic of my discussion today will be on innovation, on innovation, on business innovation. Now, I want to know, first of all, how many people here own their own businesses? Just put, put your hands. Owners of businesses, how many people work as employees in the business? The rest of us? Okay, how many people would like to start their own business? Fantastic. I like this. I like this. A lot of people are looking to become their own bosses. And it makes absolute sense. Because entrepreneurship is one way I know that you can really build your character. It forces you to build your character. It forces you to learn how to do man management and build yourself. Understand what makes people tick. Understand how to motivate people, how to inspire them, how to speak to people so that they want to work for you. They want to work with you, either as partners, as mentors, as marketers, as investors. And so I'm going to talk about, my talk today is going to talk about all of these, and I will share with you my own experience. My experience, by the way, is nothing as glamorous as Doin's experience. Like, Doin is a superstar. Round of applause for Doin, please. She's amazing, amazing lady, amazing lady. I will do this by telling you stories. Stories, stories, because I think stories are how you can take lessons from these stories and use them to your own advantage. My first story of today is the story of David and Goliath. Now, most of you know the story. That's why we're in church. But when we talk about innovation, we have to speak about David. Because so long as I can remember, David is the first person to really innovate in the Bible. When reading my Bible, I realized that what made David stand out were two things. And Doyen has already talked about one of them, which is courage. Okay? But the second one was innovation. Now, what is innovation? Innovation is different from you saying you are, most of us here, young people, people born from 1982 till date are called millennials. Now, millennials are known to be creative people. But creativity does not always equal innovation. And that's the truth. Anyone can be creative. Anyone can have a wonderful aha idea. You have that aha moment, you know? Most of your aha moments will come when you're, for most of us, taking a shower. Now, it's not that the shower itself gives you your aha moments. It's mostly because when you're in the shower, you're not with your phone. And so you're alone and you really have time to think. So that's something to just think about. Spend some time with yourself alone just so you can think. Now, David, back to the story of David. David was sent by his father to go feed his brothers that were supposed to be fighting. I said supposed to be fighting because they got there and none of them could fight because there was a big giant of a man out there. He, the guy was like eight feet tall. He's been fighting all this time. He challenged them and said, look, I want somebody to come out and challenge me. Did anybody come out? No. When David came, he said, I will fight that guy. And his elder brother, I want you to really understand this story. His elder brother, who he went to first, said, she, Papa don't tell you what you go do. You don't bring the food, I begin to go back house. Did David go back home? Did David go back home? What happened? He went around and went to see the king. Now, I'll tell you, most of you, you come up with ideas, wonderful ideas. Then what happens? You go and tell someone. It could be your elder brother, it could be your elder sister, it could be your aunt, your mom. And out of sincere and genuine love for you, what did they tell you? They said, this thing cannot work. This, this thing is okay, but I'm not sure it can work. It's not for you. And then what happens? You go back to your shell. David didn't go back to his shell. David didn't go back to his field to tend to his sheep. Instead, he went to the next person that could tell him a yes. Innovation requires courage. Courage is not the same thing as confidence. Millennials, we are confident. We dress well. We smell good. You have your weave on. And so there's no way. People looking at you will say, wow, this person is really confident. But then confidence doesn't translate to when a very big decision 
a turning point comes when you are faced with fear, then you realize that you are not courageous. So when we pray, we don't pray for God to make us confident. We must pray for the spirit of courage. Because without courage, all your confidence amounts to nothing. It's easy for us to talk about innovation, but I must talk about courage first. Because courage demands that you put yourself in uncomfortable positions. When you go to the ATM, and this is in the afternoon or in the morning, 11 o'clock in the morning, you go to the ATM, and there's a queue. This is supposed, supposed to be an ATM gallery, and you have maybe six ATMs. But there's a queue, and everybody's on one ATM. What do you do? Do you join that queue, or do you get back into your car and drive looking for the next ATM? Or there's a third alternative, because this is usually what two people do. Most people think this is that you need two alternatives. Number one, stay there, join the queue, or get into your car and look for the next ATM. But there's a third alternative. Go into the bank and ask them why their ATMs are not working. Because that's what the ATMs are for. It doesn't require innovation, it requires courage. If you're in, outside of this country, if you're in the UK, you will likely do that. You go there to report. You don't tell them you're making it. You go there and say, sorry, ma, your, your ATMs are, not, are out of order. And they'll say, oh, sorry about that. But in Nigeria, what do you do? You don't even bother. Am I, am I, am I, am I connected to you? You don't bother. You just walk away and say, no, my problem. Don't they know? But the reality is that they may not know. They may not know. And if you even bother to go there, they may not do it now because of you, but you will save the next person that will come in 30 minutes time to that same ATM because now they will go back there and say customers are complaining that there's no ATM and they will put money there. Innovation requires guts because innovation requires that you go out and find a problem and you appoint yourself the one to go and solve that problem. That's what innovation is really about. You appoint yourself as the person that's going to solve a problem. Having ideas is not enough. Innovation requires that you're able to transform your idea into an invoice. Did you get that? Until somebody can pay for your idea, then you are not innovative. You're merely creative, but you're not yet innovative. People must be willing to put their hands in their pocket and say, look, I like this idea. I'm willing to sponsor the idea, either as an investor or as a customer. I'm going to share with you several innovations that are happening within Nigeria and outside Nigeria. And, but beyond that, just telling you these stories, I want to give you a framework, a set of tools you could use. And these tools, like you can see, I'm not holding any tools, but the tools I'm going to give you today are called questions. Because I think that questions are the magical points in which we can cause ourselves to think about what we really know. Without questions, you might have the right answer to something, but that answer has nowhere to go. The questions are locked, the answers are locked up in your mind until somebody asks you the question. There are four questions you should be able to know. The first question deals with how. How? How is a very basic question. How do we do this? Because it gives you tactics. You call your mom and say, Mommy, how do we do um, a we do? And she gives you, she can tell you, okay, I will send you a text message, and she can break it down to you. Okay? It's a really basic thing, knowing how. Most of you know how to drive. It's just, it's basic. Okay? You learn it, you have it for the rest of your life. The second question is understanding what to look out for. The what. Understanding what should I be looking out for. So now everybody talks about agriculture, agriculture, let's... Um, diversify the economy, and the first thing they talk about is agriculture. But then, in the agricultural sector, a lot of people are going there with the hope of having a farm. But the agricultural sector is, such, is so wide, the value chain is so wide that many people are just looking at, oh, they want to have the farm. But very few people are thinking, oh, they want to be the ones that, to build silos, to build cold rooms, where people that own the farms can just use their cold rooms. Okay? The what, what you're thinking about is really important. The next question you should ask yourself is why? 
Why has to deal with strategy? So you get a mentor, and he's telling you what he's done or what she has done, but you must be able to ask them why they did it that way, because if you merely copy what worked in Kafanchan, and you're trying to adopt it in Abuja, it may not work, simply because the why is faulty. The reason it worked there, you don't know why it worked there, and you're merely adopting the strategy of how to bring to Abuja, it just doesn't work. And the last question you should learn to ask is, what if? What if? What if we tried this instead? David asks the question of what if. Because when David, if you read the book of 1 Samuel, when David was standing there, and, they were challenged, and Goliath is there, this was the battle that was fought in the valley of Elah. Now, David is on one part of the mountain, Goliath is on the other part of the mountain, and Goliath decides to come down into the valley. And they're looking at this big giant of a man, and he's challenging them, and he tells them, come to me, okay? If, if you no agree you, come here. March you. And everybody stays back. Everybody stays back. Nobody moves. And he says, get your knife and come to me. But everybody starts imagining, oh, for you to fight Goliath, what do you have to do? You must come with a knife. Did David kill Goliath with a knife? That is all innovation is about. Not going into a battle on somebody else's own turf, on their own terms. David got there, he got himself what he knew he was good at. What he was good at was speed. Speed with his sling. Speed is always going to be a better strategy as opposed to size. Speed. And so as new people, people, young people coming into the entrepreneurial world, what you want to know and focus on is how fast can I innovate? How fast can I create change? That has always, always, always been the best advantage. The fastest person wins. But we don't get this. But when David decided he was going to face his Goliath, he went there with his sling. He took that sling. He hit the Goliath down. Goliath cut, and he cut off his head with the giant's own sword. Now, I'm going to give you some ideas on how you can think over all the different problems we're currently facing in our country, because there are lots. And yes, I know that Nigeria is one of the toughest places to make money, but it's also one of the juiciest places. Like if you know where to look, you realize that there's money literally lying everywhere. The challenge, however, is that when you're in this reality, you don't see things in actuality. And actuality is not reality. Did you get that? No, you didn't get that. Your reality is what you see, not what is. What everybody saw was, in actuality, was a giant. What David saw, in actuality, was a giant with poor eyesight. He saw a giant that was led down. You better go back and read that book of 1 Samuel. He saw a giant that was led down by a man. Why would a giant be led down by a shield bearer? He saw a giant that couldn't see very well. That even when David was running down the mountain, what did he see? He saw Goliath saw David from far off and said, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? You read it. Was, was David carrying any stick? No. But when you are far away looking in at your problem, if you, you're seeing it's based on your own version of reality. That version has been given to you by somebody else that said, it can't be done. You can't kill this man. Go home. Your brothers that have good intentions for you, your mom that has good intentions for you, tells you, forget about this thing. Nigeria, that's so it be. Oh, don't vote. Don't vote. Your vote doesn't count. And your vote doesn't count. And you take that as your reality in 2012. It doesn't count. It doesn't count. It never counts. But nobody, and I'm sure IT people are here, nobody has thought, okay, why can't we make people vote online? 
Why can't we create that software and get people to start voting online the way they do in the UK and the US? So that's a problem waiting to be solved. That's innovation waiting to be created. And if you're waiting for the governments to do that for you, then you're making a big mistake. Because they are not of your generation, so they do not have the same insights that your generation has. But because you can see this, you can provide this as a solution to a problem. And people are doing this all day. I mean, every day. Some of you might know Kola, I know. Came up with the platform that National Open University runs in. Makes 20% of that, makes runs into billions every year. From an idea. From one idea. There are different opportunities that are disguised as problems that are waiting for people to innovate. So I'm going to give you what I will say is the questions you should be asking yourself. The first thing is your ability to look across industries, alternative industries to an industry. Look across alternative industries to industries that you're currently in and start asking yourself, if this can work in this industry, why can't it work in my industry? MTN, some of you already know, MTN has stepped into the power game now with this their new innovation called Lumos. Who has heard of Lumos, right? And I was speaking to a group a month ago, and I told them, I said, you guys better be, they were from an oil, um, from the NMPC, I said, you guys better be ready. Because Lumos is going to make people that have, I better pass my neighbor generator, stop buying fuel altogether. Because with the Lumos, I, I got one for some of my staff. And I mean, 4,005 lasts the whole month. 4,005, you buy MTN recharge card, 4,005, you recharge it, and then it, it just lasts you the entire month. It costs, you, it costs us less than 20,000 naira to buy that equipment. What that means is MTN is suddenly playing in the power sector. And they're transforming themselves. And if the current discos and jenkos are not aware, they could suddenly in three years time find themselves at the losing end to a company that they thought was in telecommunications and are suddenly innovated and are using their recharge card to buy light suddenly. You see how this works? I want us to, as Christians, to start possessing our world. That's, that's our biggest challenge because here in the city of Abuja, I see innovations every day and I, I try to know who's behind this innovation. And Sometimes, it's, it's, they're not Christians. This is not a hate speech. This, this is not a hate speech, but I want Christians to be more daring. Let me give you another innovation. Yahuza Suya, that all of you know Yahuza Suya, right? Why is Yahuza Suya so popular in Abuja? Why? Be because Yahuza decided to look at the business model in an alternative industry called fast food, where the drumsticks and the Mr. Biggs and tantalizers, they play. And they ask themselves, why can't we be like this? Why can't we, people come in there and they say, how much is chicken? And they're not going to haggle. Because if you're not buying suya from Yahuza, you're likely going to meet somewhere that you have to haggle and he tells you, if you don't know how to speak Hausa, I'm sorry for you, right? They just, they take everything you have and give very small suya. And if somebody sends you, if your boss sends you to buy suya and gives you 3,000 naira, and you don't know how to speak Hausa, and he sends somebody else with that same 3,000 naira, and the person knows how to speak Hausa, Ali will come back with suya that is like your leg. And you will come back looking like you embezzled the money. It is true. But Yahuza decided, look, we're going to just put, you know, accountability, and give people receipts, and make, whether you can speak Hausa or French, right? You get the same size. Now, Yahuza has over 12 branches in Abuja. 12. From being able to take something. Did they, did they create anything new? It already existed. But they looked across an alternative industry and adapted that into their industry. The challenge is when we wake up and we see, most of us do Me Too businesses. Me Too. Somebody's already doing it. And then you copy not only the products, 
you copy the business model. There's no business model re-engineering, no innovation brought into what you do. And so you just become like every other person. What of Habib yogurt? How many people have taken Habib yogurt? How many people enjoy Habib yogurt? When I came to Abuja in 2006, my friends tried to introduce me to Fura, and I said, me, Ibuka, drink that thing that those women are carrying on their head. Do you, those women, they don't even look like they've had their bath. God forbid. Now, there's no evening that doesn't pass. <laughs> Why? Because somebody somewhere was looking at something that was overlooked and said, how can we ha add hygiene and packaging to this? And they took something that's so lowly as Fura, and they've made a killing from it. Now, there's no way you will turn to that you won't see. They're, they're over 30 now. Because it's so simple. All they need is one small deep freezer and a blender. And that's all. That's, your total setup cost for that business is 200,000 naira. Your total setup costs as capital for that business is 200,000 naira. And you can go to any garden and start up that business as a franchise. And I'm still thinking, what, what, why didn't, what, what, what happened? Were we blinded when this opportunity was there? But the reality is that there are all these opportunities everywhere. Everywhere, every day. But unless you start asking yourself questions, like how can I adapt this into this industry to make it fit? What should I be doing differently? Somebody else will do it, and you wake up and say, ah, I had that idea. I, I, once, I thought about that idea, but doesn't, you're thinking, look, thinking does not equal to invoice. It does not equal to something in your bank account. So merely thinking is not good enough. It's no longer good enough. You must do. You must do. Invoice. Invoice. Be thinking invoice. How, who will pay for this? Who will pay for this? There are so many ideas. But the laborers are few. And though we say that we want to become entrepreneurs, the reality is that most of us don't have the mentality of entrepreneurship. We say it because it makes us look good and feel good. And I'm sure most of you know that friend that's always saying, I won't start my, my business. I will soon start my business. I will soon start my business. And every year, they are soon starting. Do you know those friends? Do you, do you have a friend like that? If you don't have a friend like that, maybe you're the friend. <laughs> but every year, they have a good idea. Some of the ideas are good. But good ideas, nobody's going to buy good ideas. Because ideas are cheap. Ideas are a dime a dozen. Anybody can wake up tomorrow and have a good idea. Okay? But converting your ideas into invoice is what labor pain is about. Because you must mix your idea with hard work. You must mix your idea with the determination that this must work. It's like a woman, look, oh, love making is easy, Pastor. Giving birth to a child is another matter altogether. That's the difference between having an idea and birthing innovation. Having an idea is love making. Bringing it to life so somebody can pay you is labor. You need both of them to succeed. And so I want to share something with you. And I think it's the most important thing I can tell you today because if you adopt this as only the one, the one thing you do, it can change your trajectory, which Doe talked about forever. You can change your trajectory is basically if you're moving like this, skew, skew like this, you can start moving this way. Change, choose every day to learn something new in your vocabulary. Increase your vocabulary. If you can do this every day, you will stop glossing over things that 
are insights to your future. So when you hear of cryptocurrency, you're going to say, cryptocurrency, what's that one again? And you skip it. And now you, know, you don't have it. And you're feeling like, don't. That was that one again. All these things, all this Bitcoin, the billion coin, all these things that used to confuse me. Hedge fund, hedge fund. What's all this hedge fund thing? They're coming to me with hedge fund. I don't like all this hedge fund. Even, even pension, it sounds strange to them still. <laughs> and you're wondering why you don't have money in your pockets. Because when you choose to expand your vocabulary, you also choose to learn the concepts behind words. That's what it basically helps you do. You start learning the concepts behind a word. A word is not just a word anymore. You really understand what this is. And if you understand what it is, then you can use it. Are we together? You can use it because now you understand what it, what it does. Then you can take advantage of it. So every day, I choose to learn a new word. Every day, I choose to learn a new word, a new concept, so that I'm not lost. The day I have a meeting with Dan Gose, I'm not sitting down there and he's talking about, oh, oh we're going to do hedge fund, we're going to hedge this, and, and I'm like, the, you, you're nodding your head furiously, say it's true, it's tr very true. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I want us to also think of this, okay? I've talked about looking across alternative industries to your industry. Second thing I'll tell you is, look across time. Look across time, look at broad horizon, look at technology that is evolving, and then ask yourself the question, how does this affect my business? How does this affect my business model? Because everything that is going on around you can affect you if you're not aware of it. Night posts, hello, night posts. <laughs> remember when we, for those of you, sorry, this will tell my age, but remember when you used to write love letters? Right? You know it. You know it. Good. Doxology. Ditto. You know it. Th those were the days when you had pen pals. Who has pen pal now? Nobody has a pen pal. Nobody uses even a pen to write. Right? Everybody. But why? What happened? Yahoo killed Nipost. The moment Yahoo came into Nigeria. Nipos thought everybody was sending letters, sending letters, but no. Gradually, people were opening Yahoo addresses, and gradually, they were abandoning pen pals and sending instant emails. And now Nipos is no more from somebody that they didn't think was the competition. But they said to themselves, well, people are sending emails, but we can still keep sending packages. And then Ife Sinachi and Chisco and God is Good and Ekenet Lichuku and all those people started doing the same thin. And now Nipos is dead. The government has spent over 13 billion in trying to resurrect a dead horse because that's what the Nigerian government knows how to do. Spend money to resurrect a dead horse. But it's not working. It's not working anymore. Because they were, they were afraid to look at the future and ask themselves, how does this affect us? So for all of you out here, those of you that read theatre comms, theatre arts, read mass communication, and you're asking yourself the question, oh, no radio station wants to employ me, no TV station wants to employ me. You have to know somebody. There is no reason right now why none of you shouldn't be an entrepreneur on their own. You could be working a, a job, but you should have a side hustle. You should have a side hustle. I tell my staff, go and have your own side hustle. Some of them are here. One has a popcorn business, another one has a dry cleaning business. And I say, go and have a side hustle. Because how you do one thing is how you do everything. And so if you're innovative on your job, you're going to likely be innovative on the business as well. Right? So you must go out. Put yourself out there. Look at the opportunities you have. Because the reality is, if you say you don't have a business, or because you don't have money, or because you don't have um, access to the market, those are, those, are, those are lies that you tell yourself. Those are excuses you tell yourself. Because I, can, I know most of us are very good in creating for ourselves champagne problems. You know what I call a champagne problem? A champagne problem is a problem that you, you want to believe that you have. It's a nice-to-have problem, right? Oh, I have too many people just come into my inbox on Facebook 
too many men are coming to toast me on Facebook. It's a champagne problem. If they toast you, sell them something. Have something to sell them. As soon as they come and say, hello, baby, you tell them, hello, baby, back, and you tell them, have you booked, have you gone on vacation today? Right? Have you gone on vacation this year or last year? And you sell them whatever it is you're selling. Because when you say, oh, I have this distraction, I have that distraction, I have 5,000 friends, my Facebook profile is blocked, 5,000 friends, those are champagne problems. Problems that you just think you have, you don't really have them. But you talk about it and you complain about it because they, they, they make you look like you have problem. They're real problems. Real problems. Go to an IDP camp, you see real problems. So stop inventing problems for yourself as an excuse of why you're not performing. You're not helping yourself. You're not doing yourself any favors. You're certainly not doing society any favors either by hiding your best ideas and waiting for a perfect time when it doesn't exist. You must be able to look across time and tell yourself, even though there's a problem here, how can we change our business model? Don Jazzy did this. When Don Jazzy realized that the markets with the Alaba boys, he was not going to win them. The Nigerian police were not going to be enforcing copyright laws because, I mean, come on, how many CDs can they possibly be born in? How many shops can they possibly, I mean, there's Idumota, there's um, the one in Eweka Road on the chair. There's, come on, they can't do that. They can't do all of that. What, do, what does he do? He looks at technology and starts partnering with MTN and Glow and selling callback tunes. And now he's making, he's making like 150 million every quarter just on callback tunes, just on jazzy. Why? Because he's looking at technology and befriending that technology and asking himself, like, why, why, should, why should I be even wasting money doing CDs when I can, people, one million people can download something for 50 Naira. And suddenly, I've made my money for the months. And so every time, they're bringing out these new hits, and you're wondering what's going on. And you realize now you don't even have to wait for the music video. They bring out the music video, they release it for free online. Because they've changed their business model. Now sometimes you have to ask yourself, the problem is not so much that your product is wrong, is that the market you're selling to may be wrong, or they've moved on to trying to buy in a different way. So how do you change yourself? So you make life more easier. Human beings will keep looking for better ways to improve the quality of their life, more convenience. And so if you're an entrepreneur listening to this message now, what I'm telling you is find a way to make whatever you're selling a lot more convenient for your end user to purchase. And if necessary, change the customer. I'll explain. You change your customer by Understanding that there's a difference between a customer and a client. I used to publish a uh, magazine a couple of years back, which I stopped because of technology again. It was called Abuja Shelter. And I realized this, that the customer is not the clients. The customers buy the magazines. The client pays for adverts in the magazine. Right? You must understand this. Once you understand this, then you start asking yourself, okay, I'll give another example. The school, our school here, okay? There are two people, the students and the parents. This is school fees week. Thank God we've just, I mean, like school fees week, yeah? Parents, sorry. <laughs> so now, the customer is the students. The client is the parents. Sometimes we spend all our time trying to convince the clients. We tell them that we have wonderful laboratories, well-stocked libraries, computer rooms, whiteboard, electronic boards, all in an attempt to lure the clients. When sometimes oh, all we really need is to go to tell the students, we'll give you a free iPad. <laughs> and that can change and they'll be the one telling their mommy, mommy, I must go to this school, I must go there, everybody's going there, and they would seek you first. You must start understanding how to market differently if your ideas are ever going to see the light of the day. And change the market orientation. 
let me give you another idea on how you can think differently. You think differently by your ability to change the market's orientation of an idea. Every idea, people buy anything for two reasons. Number one, for price. Price is functional. Secondly, for how it makes them feel. Anything that makes you feel good has an emotional purchase attached to it. So if you buy a Gucci shoe, right, it's all emotional. Hello? Like, a Gucci shoe will not make you run faster. If a dog is pursuing you now, the Gucci shoe, it doesn't help you. The dog doesn't know, first of all, that it's a Gucci shoe. I've been bitten by a dog before, so I, I know that this dog did not know I was wearing a Gucci jeans. He didn't know. If it knew, of course, you'd say, I'm going to pull your jeans by bite you. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't help. Now, you must ask yourself, how do I bring a product in the market and change the orientation so that the market sees something that they're excited about a product? However, to answer this question, let me give you an example. And people will deny here because we're all Abuja people and we're Tush. How many people know the Smart Perfume? Okay, you know it. How many people use the Smart Perfume? All right, fantastic. Because the cost of perfume is very expensive now since the dollar, I mean, the perfume is now 30,000 naira, 35,000 naira, 100,000 for wood, yeah? So you have really expensive perfumes. But the smart guys, being smart, will take a perfume, give you the same sense for 2005. For even less, one eighth. Yeah, some, some bought one eighth. Why? Because the reality is, why would you buy a perfume, right? And you buy the perfume for 38,000 naira. My grandmom, oh my, my grandmom loved perfumes, loved perfumes. So when she died, we ran back to the village. Ah, because she had money. She had a very nice restaurant, like Doin's restaurant, nice restaurant. We ran there and we said, ah, she will have all these diamonds and pearls and things. So we ran to the village. Hoping, myself and my twin brother, we went to the village, hoping that we would get there in advance before our parents come. And we brought back, you know, all the mothers, you know those big trunk? Those big, we brought out the trunk from under the bed, said we must find all these things. Students, yeah? So we brought, opened this trunk, and we saw all the perfume bottles. <laughs> Dusty, old, finished. She has been keeping since 19, before the war. <laughs> It was a very sad day, very sad day. <laughs> but that's the nature of that perfume. I mean, I'm using that as an example because people, we, we like smelling good, right? But these smart people are making more money than any other perfumer can actually boast about. Simply because they did not choose to go to the emotional part of perfumes. They're using the same kind of bottle for all different scents. So they are reducing the cost automatically. How can this apply to you? If you go to an industry, or you're currently in an industry where everybody is doing one thing and they're trying to outdo themselves by doing their house more expensive, more unique, more classy, can you go the opposite way, please? Because if you keep going that way, you're going to be like the rest of them. But when you go the other way, you have a, a very big chance of getting a market that is currently being ignored currently being ignored. The perfume industry is just one of the industries. I mean, Lady Gaga, <laughs> Lady Gaga comes in and says, oh, she's doing a perfume. And she says she's going to put her blood inside. Right? Did you hear that? That's how much they're, they're trying to persuade you now. She said she was going to put her blood inside the perfume bottle so that anybody that buys the perfume will feel that they, they have a part of her with, with them. And American girls, you know American girls, they say, oh my, oh my. And they went to buy. I can assure you, the smart perfume guys, they don't put their blood in there. So the iPhone 8 is out. Yeah. Amen? <laughs> the iPhone 8 is out. And the iPhone 8 has, for the first time, you know that they're running out of ideas. So they brought out two iPhone 8s. 
that looks exactly like the Samsung 8, right? And the brother has an iPhone 10. I don't know what happened to 9, but now 10. X is 10 in Roman numerals. Some be saying X, X, X. <laughs> right? Now, what that shows you is sometimes even the most innovative people in the industry, they run out of ideas. And then they are replaced by the next best thing. And that next best thing could be you. It's really that simple. But you must choose yourself. You must choose yourself. Life is not like reality TV shows. Life is not like The Voice Nigeria. The Voice Nigeria, only one person will likely win that. Yesterday, on The Most Beautiful Girl, one person has emerged. One person, one winner. Life does not present one winner. Everybody here can be winners. Everybody, each and every single one of you can be winners. But you must choose yourself. You must pick yourself. You must choose a platform and say, this is the platform I will, I, this will be my domain. Because right now, your real blockade is your fear. That's stopping you. After you clap for doing, right, and you tell yourself and you write all these notes, what then confronts you when you go back home is your fear. You won't go do them. So. <laughs> and that, that's it. You, you challenge your fears by having courage, by having faith, by praying for this. Because faith, it's fear that said its prayers. When fear says its prayers, it gives you faith. And you, you can embolden yourself. It says you, you encourage yourself in the Lord. Right? That's what gives you courage to go ahead. So even when your elder brother, like David's elder brother, says no, what do you say? You say, I'll be back. Then you go and look for the next person that will say yes. Because some people will only tell you no, because that's all they can tell you. Hello? Some people do not have the app. They don't have the power to give you a yes. And so what would they do? They tell you no instead so that they can exercise their power. Security guards, drivers, secretaries, right? August PA. They cannot give you what you're asking for, but they can always block you from seeing madam. Say, no, you can't see Pastor Sarah now. No. Do you have appointments? Are you on appointments? <laughs> and protocol will block you. And they don't have the power to tell you yes, but they only have the power to tell you no. And if you take that person's no as your final answer, then you're, you're not like David. You're not a man after God's own heart. <laughs> and so my message to you is two things. Number one, choose yourself. I want you to write this down. Choose yourself. Did anybody choose David? David chose himself. He was not even a member of the army. He chose himself that I will be the one to slay these giants of a man. When every other person was standing here, looking down into the valley, seeing a big man, David said, I will be the one to slay him. So choose yourself and choose your battle. Look for the battle. Look for your problem and say, it's me that will solve this problem. And you appoint yourself. Because when you appoint yourself, then power comes upon you. Then God knows the reason why he will put his power in you to walk through you. God is in the business of killing giants. He's not looking for your champagne problems. I don't know if I will buy the um, Samsung 8 or the iPhone 8. And that's your problem. And they'll come and tell you, please advise me. I don't know if I should buy the Samsung A's. Which one will be shinier if I want to do? Come on. <laughs> in rounding up, in rounding up, I'm out of time. And I'll tell you this last thing because it's quite important. If I, if, I, if I don't tell you, then I'm going to do you a disfavor. Look across your buyer's 
value map. Every buyer has something that they have, they, they're looking for. Let me explain. Who remembers when Kia came to Nigeria? Kia. Kia came to Nigeria, and nobody was buying Kia. Why? Because they said, what kind of car is Kia? And they said, it's from Korea. Korea, Kwa. Which one is Korea? When did Korea do such a car? No big calculator did they do, and stabilizer. <laughs> and nobody was buying Kias. And so Kia had to go back to the drawing board and ask themselves the question, why are people not buying from us? And the question, the answer was, they don't know if you can get spare parts, and the, people don't even know how they can repair this kind of car. And so Kia then rolled out and said, look, we have three years warranty. Whatever sports your car come, we'll fix it for you free of charge. The moment they did that, their sales skyrocketed. That's innovation. They didn't do anything differently. They simply went and asked the customer the question, why are you not buying from us? And then they innovated based on the customer's response. Imagine, so they were asking, what, don't just come and buy from us today and go and have your problems. No, what happens after you buy from us? Imagine how would it feel like if your mechanic could do the same thing. Has anybody ever taken their car to the mechanic and when they bring it back, even though you told them to just change the brake pad, you enter inside your car and everywhere is stained. Even the ceiling of your car is stained. And you're wondering how. Hello? <laughs> Mechanics do that, right? If a mechanic could go the extra mile and choose to wash your car afterwards, even if he charges you an, ex an extra 5,000 naira, do you think he will mind so much? That's how you must think. You must think about what happens before people buy from you, when they buy from you, and then after they buy from you. And if you can do this, you're definitely going the extra mile, and I'll see you at the top. Thank you very much.